Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the session on uh, the MPC for databases. And this will be certainly the best session because now you are talking. <laughs> so uh, we have the first talk that will be given by uh, Val Kolesnikov and Tal Malking, and that they will be talking about uh, blind shear scalable private database query. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, um, so this is um, our work of the past uh, couple of years uh, with a pretty large team, mostly people from Colombia. Um, so other than Tal, is Steve Bellowin, Sengal Choi, Ben Fish, uh, Angelos Karamitsis, Fernando Krell, Vasilis Pas Papas, and Dean Vo, and uh, people who did summers or some longer stays with us in Wesley George and Abhi Kumar Subramanian. And of those, Ben and Fernando are here, if you also want to talk to them. Um, so this is, um, this is a project on private databases. Um, it's part of the work uh, done uh, with IARPA. <coughs> So the, um, both Tal and I will talk about the project, um, about what we did. So this is roughly how we uh, assign what we're going to talk about. And just in a few words, I'm going to say what the project is about. Then Tal will cover uh, the basic algorithms, um, uh, you know, the system architecture and the basic algorithms. And I'll talk a little bit more on additional features, um, such as protection against malicious players. Um, uh, so, we'll see. I guess we expect people will ask questions as we go. So, we'll see how much material um, we'll be able to, um, to cover. So, I, I was wondering, uh, why does IARPA cares about this? And, the, you know, this, this project seems to be very pro-privacy. Um, um, and last uh, year in a workshop, there was a workshop, a Demax workshop on cryptography in, um, uh, in AT&T. And uh, Tim Edgar, who uh, was giving a talk, and turns out that sort of, there is a guy who is called the deputy for civil liberties for the director of national intelligence. So there is, uh, it looks like there is some effort to, you know, to, to, uh, to care about people's privacy at uh, every level of, uh, <coughs> of the government. Um, <clears throat> so this project and, and this talk, what, what we're going to talk about, so we're solving a specific problem. Um, so it's kind of MPC, but uh, so it's a specific problem, but uh, a general MPC will be the main tool here. So this is um, kind of how this related. Um, so our work um, was, we were recently notified that it will appear in Oakland. Uh, so the, mostly what Tal will, will be talking about, that's the uh, content of the Oakland uh, paper. Um, and this is what this project is. So this is, uh, so this slides, intends to give you the scale, um, the features, roughly what, what, what is the goal of the project. So it's, it's a medium-sized database for today, about so 100 million records, 10 terabyte um, uh, total size. And we want to do a real-life query. So very rich uh, query set should be supported. So you know, like a general Boolean formulas, range queries, um, all sorts of tricky things, and, and more. This is just uh, some of the uh, things that, that we're dealing with. And the uh, important requirement is that it has to be really fast. Um, we were allowed, uh, according to the contract, according to the BAA, extremely small overhead compared to the plain text um, evaluation of the data. So two to you know, maybe factor 10 <coughs> overhead compared to, um, to MySQL. So this is a kind of introductory project setup, and Tao will uh, take over. OK, so um, all right. Uh, I want to talk about the basics of the project. Um, so first of all, these requirements, Vlad kind of sent them very quickly, but they seem very hard to achieve, maybe even impossible. And I just wanted to comment a little bit um, so for example, when uh, Yuda said that maybe it's hard to do, then he took it back, maybe to do massive data sets. Indeed, it seems very hard, and there are some theoretical impossibility. For example, that everything in, um, for secure computation has to be at least linear in the size of the 
of the data for interesting computation and we can't afford it for large data. So it's clear we must relax security guarantees somehow. Um, and this, so uh, what we did here, we tried to find a good way to relax security guarantees while achieving all the requirements and the performance and uh, doing it in a good way. And the question is how, and so for example, one way to break the linear bound is to do secure computation with ORAMs, uh, right? Like we, did, we had a CCS uh, 2012 paper on it and there are many follow-up work and Mariana will talk on some uh, other work on that approach. So that could be seen as an example where what you leak is the runtime. You, I'm willing to leak the runtime and I'm willing to do amortized pre-processing. It's no longer, you, you no longer have to be linear. But even that is way, way, way too inefficient for, you know, doing twice as fast as, uh, you know, the database queries that are not secure. So I am not going to talk about all of this. This is all uh, open area of research that we haven't completed and very interesting. Uh, is how to do, what does it mean, how to find the right trade-off. Okay, this is just a bunch of questions I wrote. What we want is to find something that has to be meaningful and reasonable. The security, whatever it is, has to be provable. Um, and I think both David mentioned something like that in his talk, um, and it came up in other talks. It's very hard to tell. It's a, I, I wanted to encourage you to try to work on it, even from a, either a theoretical perspective or a practical perspective, how to evaluate. Is this leakage? How is that? Okay, here is what we leak. Is that too much? Is that too little? How do we formalize it? How do we say whether it's good or not? Um, so we did not solve all of that. What I will do is I'll describe our system, uh, the basic system and approach. Um, I'll touch upon some of our trade-offs, okay? And... Uh, you know, try, we don't have any formal justification why these trade-offs are okay. I'll try to talk about it a little bit. Um, and I'm really skipping most of our system because given the time, there's no way to really describe everything we did. But I'll try to touch on some interesting things. I'll focus on Boolean queries only. And I'll focus on semi-honest parties. Uh, Vlad will touch on extensions. We did many other kinds of queries. Uh, we have policy, which I think, Vlad, you didn't mention. We have a, p a policy. Oh, I will mention in a minute. So uh, I'm, I'm skipping a lot of stuff in terms of the, the technical part, but I'll try to touch on the interesting things. Let me just add one thing about uh, what you're allowed to leak and what not. It seems, so our system is searching a database with uh, co complex queries. It seems maybe it's okay and necessary for performance to leak access patterns, right? So uh, maybe somehow, you know, you want, if you, have, um, if you have one query and you have another query, if you use, um, it, it, it seems justifiable that I would be willing to leak that uh, my first query and my second query had, uh, were the same, for example. This is not acceptable in standard crypto security, but we will leak it. Okay, but we will leak a little more than that, and I'll show what. Okay, so let me start with the system architecture. Um, there are four parties here. Uh, let me start by saying that this, the, there are four logical parties. We really need three parties. The query checker could be the same as the server. But uh, the system works like this. So there's the client and there's the server. The server has the data, and the client wants to search. So already one compromise towards the trade-off is adding a third party of the index server, this was already in the BAA from the government, that, that helps a lot uh, to reduce the performance cost. So this index server is not trusted with neither the data of the, data of the server nor with the queries of the client. He's not allowed to learn either of them. We want to protect both uh, privacy, but he's trusted to behave honestly and trusted not to collaborate with the other parties. So the way the system works is first there's a setup pre-processing stage where the server and the index server um, uh, construct an index, so the index server will, con will have the encrypted database and an uh, index structure on top of it. Uh, then when the client comes online, he has a search with the index server. While he searches, there is the um, policy, the query checker that checks the policy. If the query does not satisfy the policy, then uh, the client will receive an output that there are no matches found. Okay? He wouldn't know whether the policy failed or there are no matches found. And at the end, um, if there are matches found, he gets the encrypted records from the index server and finally has some um, correspondence with the server to decrypt those records and get the actual answers. Okay, so that's the general architecture. Yeah. So the server, what does it do? First, it does the setup, which is uh, set the index and the encrypted data structure and the encrypted uh, data 
at the index server first, and then at the end, he interacts with the user to uh, let, give the user keys to decrypt the output. Because the user gets the encrypted records from the index server, and now he needs to decrypt them, the client. OK, so I'll just describe a few tools that we use. Um, so we'll use the Yao's garble circuit. Um, and let me just remind you how that works. That was a joke. <laughs> We've seen it 10 million times, but we will use that. The uh, point of this is very, very fast for small problems, right? For small circuits. Uh, and the question is how to scale. So uh, this is just uh, some approach that we did is, you know, we try to identify privacy critical subroutines, implement them securely uh, using Yao garble circuit and then insecure implementation of the rest. And then analyze what you get out of it. Okay, so Good, and it's a hard challenge to understand and formalize what the security guarantees are. Um, good, so this is what we did. I want to note that, of course, you cannot apply Yao on the whole data, okay? Um, the data is 10 terabytes. Um, okay, so the other, um, the other tool we use is a Bloom filter data structure. Uh, that's a data structure that allows in a constant, uh, allows constant insertion and constant search. So basically you have, uh, a bunch of hash functions, and for every element you want to insert, uh, you hash it, you get a bunch of you know, 20 indices, and you set them to one. And if you want to search, you check whether all of them are one, and you get it. Um, and it has a certain false positive rate, no false negative, and you can uh, choose the parameter so that the false positive rate is small, as small as you want. Um, um, and so we uh, I'll talk about encrypted BF. Uh, we'll we'll want to encrypt the um, the terms that we put in. So we will use uh, something called occluded BF, which is exactly the same as BF. It's the same data structure, Bloom filter, which is, uh, of course, needless to say, a very useful data structure that appears all over the place, the Bloom filter. We wanted to uh, hide it. And let me try to say a little bit about why. So the point is, the index server will be holding a Bloom filter. You will see how it works. The index server will be holding a Bloom filter, and the client will try to find out some matches on it. And we want to hide from whoever's holding the Bloom filter whether there was a match or not. Okay? We don't want him to know whether there was a match or not. So one way to do it is to apply Yao on the whole Bloom filter. Uh, but we don't want to do it because the whole Bloom filter is too big. So what we will do is we'll apply Yao only on the relevant indices, but the actual content of the indices will be masked, okay, uh, with a one-time pad, with a, with a pseudorandom function, okay? So the, what the index server holds for each Bloom filter will be the, the original Bloom filter that we want, XORed with um, uh, uh, um, pseudorandom function, with a string generated by a pseudorandom function that the user has, the client has the key for. Okay, and this is very amenable to efficient Yao because it's XOR. Um, yeah, okay. So let me, so these were, so I said Yao, I said Bloom filter. Let me just show you the whole data structure of the, uh, that the index server holds. So first of all, the index server holds encryption, normal good encryption of each record of the data. And in addition to that, it has a tree of Bloom filters. Okay, and the tree wor works like this. There's on the bottom level, which I guess right is the bottom. On the bottom level, there's a Bloom filter for each record, uh, and that basically contains all the keywords in that record. Okay, um, or you know the keywords in the column name, uh, everything corresponding to that record. So we have a Bloom filter for each record. Then at each point of the tree, you insert all the terms and all the records in the subtree under it. Okay. So that's the data structure that it holds. And uh, now when the client wants to search for whether some, uh, some keyword exists and which records match a certain keyword uh, or a certain more complex query over keyword, he will start by executing, by, by searching the topmost, the root Bloom filter to just check whether it's there. And the way he searches to check whether it's there, this is a secure two-party computation using Yao. Okay? Um, so depending on the query, so he asks the question, and um, then if the answer is yes, that means somewhere in the hall, in the leaves of the tree, there are records satisfying those. Uh, l let me take a concrete example. Let's say he's looking for something like A and B, okay? So he wants all the records that have both A and B in the keywords. So if he gets yes here, it means that 
Um, there are some records with A and some records with B somewhere. That's all he knows. And then he checks the, the children. And so if this BF says no, it means none of its children have um, A and B. So it, it means uh, there's either A doesn't exist in that subtree or B doesn't exist in that subtree or both. But that subtree said yes, so there's something there. And he goes on. Whenever there's a yes, you go on. And at the end, um, when you get to the, to the leaves, if you have a yes, that means both A and B are in this record, and therefore you can obtain that record. OK? So in this, in general, you can search keywords or any, any uh, complicated formula this way. I'm going very fast, but if you have a question, please stop me. Forget to look at the time. Hold on. I'll start the timer. OK, <laughs> I just don't want to go over Vlad's time. OK, yeah, so this is how you search. Um, good, so what is leaked? That's, that's the big question. What is leaked here? Oh, the, the, the search is, uh, oh, I'll talk about efficiency later. But clearly, it doesn't require linear time, right, to go over all the records, unlike uh, secure computation, uh, full secure computation. But certainly, a lot of things are leaked here, right? Um, so let me try to talk a little bit about what is leaked. So one thing that is leaked is the query pattern, because if later, the, let's say I come with the exact same query, they will do the exact same path. But even if I come with a query that's similar, so in the first query I asked A and B, and then later I'll come with a query that says, I don't know, A or C, the index server might see something that there's some similarity, both because the indices to the Bloom filter will be similar, they'll have some intersection, um, and he will also learn the return record access pattern, so he will see at the end, even if I ask completely different disjoint queries, they might have the same matches. And he will see that we got there. These things, I think, are easier to argue, although I don't know how to formally do so, but easier to argue that are not a big deal and are necessary if you want efficiency, and it's not a big deal to leak the patterns. Um, we also leak the tree search pattern, which... Um, I'll talk about a little more. So if this is the tree, you know, and let's say my solutions, my matches were in five and six, what uh, the index server sees, um, he, he knows what the path was that was taken. Okay, and that teaches him something um, about the query. Recall that the index server doesn't know what the data is, but still this gives some information. I'll try to qualify what it is a little bit. Okay, so what does it mean? Let me start with an example for OR queries. So, um, let me see. If here you have an R query, you will never have, let me go back to the previous thing. Yeah, so this example could never be uh, OR. It couldn't be that here I search for OR. Because an OR, there would never be something where you, you said yes and then you got a no. Uh, right? Uh, no, actually it could be OR. So forget it. Sorry, I apologize. but. Okay, so but what is true, so for our queries, when, if I ask, is there A or B on the top, if it says yes, then I know there is something there for sure. There is no pruned, um, I thought that example had a pruned, pruned branch, but it didn't. There's no pruned branch ever for an or. Um, I would never say, there would never be a yes, and then I go, 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 and never get anywhere, right? It couldn't be. Whereas for an end, you could have, you could have, yes, there's both A and B in the leaves, but at the end, there's no single record that has both. So for R, it turns out that the tree pattern leaks nothing more than the access pattern. So if you knew, uh, and in fact, the first time ever you set up the system, you do an OR, it leaks nothing other than the number of results. Because the tree is organized, the order of the leaves is random. And if you know the number of results, you just choose a bunch of random leaves and you do the path and that's all that's revealed. Once you ask more queries without uh, reinitializing the, the tree, some information is leaked about the, the pattern. Uh, and the efficiency for OR is proportional to the number of results, right? Again, it's, you know, the, it's just for every re results, I mean, a matching uh, answers. For every matching answers, I have, every matching answer, I have a path, okay? Now, for end queries, so, so this is optimal in some way. I mean, we'll, we'll see real performance results, but at least theoretically, it's optimal. Um, I must have at least as, as the size of the output, right? Uh, for end queries, it's more complicated. Both the, the efficiency and the leakage are related to each other. Uh, so for end, it's more complicated. The tree search pattern reveals more because you can also see, um, you know, you see that you went and went and went and then stopped. 
And so you know, and if you stopped and never got anywhere, then you know that he searched for something where some leaves satisfied some of the terms and some leaves satisfied some other terms, but no leaf satisfies both. And that gives information both to the client and to the index server, some information. Um, and it's also related to the efficiency. So because the, the efficiency is how many nodes we checked. Every time we check a node is a, is a Yao computation involving, you know, that's, that's the heavy computation. I mean, it's not that heavy, but involving, you know, computing a small Yao circuit depending, the circuit is the query, okay? Um, and some XOR for the Bloom filter. So the efficiency for end queries are um, proportional to the number of matches for the best term. So if the query is A and B and C and D, uh, and A has one answer and B has seven answers, et cetera, that will be proportional to the, small, the term with the smallest number of matches, okay? Um, and this is, you would, you would have liked something proportional to the total number of matches, but, uh, but you can't, and this seems asymptotically optimal even without security. Um, and this is in particular what uh, MySQL does um, in terms of, you know, if you have A and B and C, unless you had specific index that uh, for every three terms, it gives you uh, the efficiency is proportional to the number of matches for each of them. Uh, but this abandoned path um, both give you informa both leak information and um, make the runtime bigger, okay? And it's, there's some, so we, 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 uh, we have some work in progress proving that some of this is inherent, but in any case, this leaks something. Um, now, if I go, this was R and N, if I go to arbitrary Boolean formulas, the efficiency is very nice. The efficiency for any arbitrary formula, no matter how you, you do it, you could imagine that you look at the CNF representation of the formula and you look at the term uh, with the smallest number of matches and the performance is um, proportional to that or less. And what's nice about it is you don't need to translate it to CNF. You don't need to know which term has how many matches. You don't need to know anything. This happens automatically by the tree. Okay, um, and the leakage is what I said before, access pattern and the tree search pattern. It's hard to quantify exactly how much it is, uh, but it's much less than giving information on, on patterns of each individual term, but it does give some information. Okay, um, good. So, oh, we have a definition and a proof, but our definition is kind of the... the kind of definition, what the definition leaks, Exactly. So our, our definition is the ideal model leaks the, the tree pattern. I mean, this is what we leak. But, so we have a proof that we don't leak more than that. But what the meaning of this is, we don't have any kind of proof what this means. Yeah. Can you compare the leakage to the OST or the structuring to the leakage? No, I don't know anybody can answer. OXT construction? The one from crypto? Yeah. Uh, oh, yes. OXT is the IBM construction? Yes, I can compare the leakage. I didn't know what OXT is. Uh, yes. So uh, that's interesting. So this, this project, just to give uh, the, the background, AR Paspar was given to a bunch of teams for phase one, and for phase two it uh, was given to us and to IBM. And they have a different kind of system uh, with incomparable leakage. So I'll, uh, I'll, uh, there are pros and cons. You're asking about leakage specifically? Or? OK. So they, their uh, queries have to be of the form A, and something, okay? And then both the runtime and the leakage depends on the number of matches for A for the first term. So this means both for arbitrary formulas, this might be linear, it's not sublinear, okay? Unless the, so the client needs to guess which term would be the best and put it first. And it also leaks how many um, results A had separately, which ours doesn't. So this is for their general formula. If their formula is on the form A or B or C, they basically just do the search separately for A, separately for B, separately for C. They leak a lot of information on individual terms. So we're better than them in that for sure in terms of protecting individual terms. Um, however, they have, uh, they have other advantages over us. So they definitely have advantage over what I'm talking about and that they have malicious client and I'm only describing honest but curious. Uh, but Vlad will talk about malicious. Okay, that's one. And um, also we have a very interactive uh, protocol at each step. So depending on the number of matches, they are sometimes uh, better performance than us. Uh, yeah. Could you 
mixed all your ideas with some noise in the uh, in the search query when you add some. From the client point of view, yeah. what, what are you you're talking about privacy for privacy? Yeah. So that you could reduce this leakage. I mean, of course. The yeah, we did. I'm, I skipped so many things. So in fact, it's kind of related to the next thing I was going to say. Uh, but but let me answer your question more generally. Um, you could do things like add dummy things, and the client searches more. But it's very hard to do it in a in a. You, you can't do it in a way that will reduce the leakage to negligible, with negligible security. So it's a little related to the next point that I'll show you, which is one specific example. We have many other uh, points. Does any, did I miss something about comparison with IBM? I think I compared. Um, yeah, the, it's, it's very hard to compare because, for example, the whole aspect that I'm not talking about at all is policy. Right, we need to apply policy. So there, there's, there's, you know, who? So um, there's, do you need to keep the policy secret? You don't want the client to know what the policy is. Can the server know what it is? Can whoever checks the, not the server, the index server, can whoever checks the policy um, learn? So more, what can they learn about the query? Is it okay to say the query asks about this column and this column and that column, or is that not okay? It's very. There, there are many trade-offs. Uh, to play, and that's, I think, an interesting area for research. Okay, so let me see the time. Okay, um, I just need to leave time for Vlad. Uh, okay, so let me just say this. Hmm. Uh, let me just hand wave this in, instead of, of talking really about it. But one thing. Um, so we want one specific case. We did want to improve the leakage. Is to uh, hide the difference between zero matches and one match for the index server, OK? Um, this was presented to us as a requirement, and we came up with a motivating example. I don't know what was the real motivating example. Uh, but the motivating example we came up with is, uh, let's say there's an airline, uh, and you want to search you know, whether the list of the airline, uh, whether the list of passenger contains uh, some terrorist. And the thing is, if uh, you don't want the, so it's unlikely that the answer will be seven terrorists, right? It's mostly the, the answer will be zero almost always, right? But sometimes it might be one, okay? And you really don't want the airline to know whether the answer was zero or one, okay? For example, one could cause panic, etc. Um, however, if we wanted to completely hide the number of answers, uh, that doesn't seem possible with this performance. Okay, and you can't just hide between zero and one with negligible probability, because then you could show you could comp hide any number of answers. So what can you do? Well, okay, f we show that there is, you know, for any epsilon that you want, non-negligible. For any one over polynomial, you can say you can't tell the difference between zero and one except for one over poly. But that's kind of not good enough because what we wanted to add in addition to that is that even with this small one over poly probability that's non-negligible, if the bad case happens the news is not terrible. It's not awful catastrophic. OK, so we, um, we had this definition um, of indistinguishability saying this. So let's assume there's an a priori distribution of what the um, probability of one is. OK, let's say the airline knows the probability of a match is whatever, delta. And delta is small, 0 0.01, some small constant. What I want is even in the worst case, no matter what randomness I choose, at most, they will double. If they knew the probability is 0 0.01, and then they see the, if they see what actually happened, maybe they will gain absolute confidence that the answer was 0. I don't mind leaking that. But if the answer was actually 1, they would never say, OK, now I know for sure it's 1. It's at most will go up to twice as much. OK, so that's, I know I'm not explaining it clearly, but I, I just wanted to give an idea that's very similar to your question. Uh, because the technique of how to do it is indeed by adding extra dummy paths. Okay, with a certain distribution um, that for which we can prove the claim. Okay, so the client, what does it mean adding paths? The client decides, even if the answer is no, the client, the client decides not to stop but keep going uh, to, for a certain number, a random number of times. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll give some performance results and that's the end and then Vlad will talk. Uh, these performance results are from a year ago, I guess, from a long time ago, from phase one, uh, we have brand new performance results that are not yet uh, in a slide format or even in any other format 
for me. But uh, oh, I wanted to say um, it's a good ch chance to say it. This was uh, the performance was evaluated by Lincoln Labs, and there's uh, three people from Lincoln Labs <laughs> here who did this. So I guess it's your your uh, slide more or less. Uh, <laughs> So, um, so I'll talk a bit about performance from a year ago. There's the much better performance now with optimizations that Vlad will mention. So this is comparison to the uh, MySQL, the insecure thing. Uh, this is for a single, so I'll just give you uh, approximately, this is for a single keyword search, not a complex query. Um, okay, so uh, the first, all of these, the first four, uh, have a single result. It's some keyword search where there's only one matching record. Okay, so we are not much worse than MySQL, not much at all, and we have, as you see, we have the same performance in all, these are different kinds of queries. Um, and we have the same performance uh, in all of them because we, we, we uh, so this int and star, and so there is, uh, never mind. So we do, we do the, the point is we, we have, uh, for if there's a single match, we have very good performance and similar to MySQL. Um, the next ones have more than one match, so you see two to 10 matches in all of them. And in that case, we do worse than my, more, a bigger factor worse than MySQL. Um, and you, we have a large variance because it depends on how you organize the tree, what, what your lack is there. Um, Okay, this is, um, okay, so in general, very general, it, and it's very clear also why if you see the system, if you have few results, we have very, very good results. The more results there are, meaning the more matches there are for the query, the worst results we have because we do more and more over the tree, and that involves interaction at each layer. Um, so when you have 5,000 results, this is about 15 times worse than MySQL. Um, now we improved it significantly, so... Uh, okay, so, and this I think is interesting. This is the Boolean query, which is what I was talking about. Um, so the first three bars are conjunctions of two terms, A and B, where they were chosen such that A has a single record uh, that matches it, and B has either one or 100 or 10,000 records that match it. Okay, and as you see, even if B has 10,000 records that match it, and A has a single record that matches it, the performance really goes similar to the smallest term. It doesn't matter how many matches are in the other term. Okay, and this is to compare with IBM. If they had A and B, they would have the same results as us. But if they put B and A, if they put B first, then the result would be terrible there. Um, okay, the next, the DNF is a more complex query. It's not just A and B. It's a more complex query in DNF form, uh, and it had uh, more results. Okay. And when it has more results, I'm not sure how many results it had. Maybe the Lincoln Lab people remember, but it, it, uh, so they designed the experiment. They had more results, and then both MySQL um, is slower, and we are slower. Um, and the last one is interesting, which I don't understand. We need to go look back at it. But the last one is an end of two things, A and B. There's range query in there. Uh, but the point is they were designed especially for the worst case of our system. So A has many matches and B has many matches, but A and B has few matches. Okay, and so I understand well why our system doesn't do well. This is the worst case for our system, uh, but it was supposed to be bad for MySQL as well. So that I don't understand and uh, I couldn't figure it out. Maybe Fernando and Ben know? Um, anyway, so, uh, but... Um, this, this was supposed to be pretty bad for MySQL as well, okay, because they, they didn't do indices for, for two-term queries. Um, oh, good, I'm done. So, uh, Vlad. So, this can release the access pattern, right? Yeah. The, the access pattern, the tree search pattern. Or with, yeah. The tree search pattern is more information than access yeah. pattern. So, yeah. what? I mean, so there, there are ways of testing, of having encrypted boom flows, but testing it that are not interactive. That are not interactive? That are not interactive. So Pro has a construction that allows you to do this. And so do you actually need it to be sitting on the... Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, we'll talk about it. I mean, his paper from 2003, right? But uh, this is a single keyword uh, search, and we'll do... But we'll 
let's, you know, I want to cover other stuff. So, all right, so Tal mentioned that there's a bunch of optimizations, and uh, the most efficient one is the most obvious one is the parallelization, which we didn't do for phase one, and we kind of uh, properly or more or less properly implemented it, and now it's about 15 times faster. So whatever the numbers you saw, they consist of two parts. One is data transfer, one is search. So data transfer didn't improve, probably, from the parallelization, but the search time improved. So you can uh, scale the numbers that, you know, the, the bars from so before correspondingly using proper algorithm. Um, so uh, we did better Bloom filter analysis a little bit better. Um, in the you know in the numbers that you saw before, we uh, each you know uh, each search included um, Bloom filter that uh, had 10 to minus 6 false positive rate, but uh, that was a requirement for the final output that the probability that you return the wrong record is 10 to minus 6. But um, internal nodes you don't need that. So um, by uh, doing uh, by increasing false positive on internal nodes, we got two things simultaneously. Uh, the, the, um, we have a performance improvement because you don't need to touch on so many bits, so the circuits that we'll evaluate will be smaller. And second is that there will be naturally introduced noise into the tree search pattern. So now there is less information leaked. So there is performance and security improvement from that. Uh, there are some things that uh, I guess I was going to talk about now. Uh, I'm going to skip a little. We could have tried. Well, we, we, did, we, we did implement several uh, variants of, of garbled circuit. We tried um, and we did get some improvement, but not as much as I hoped or we still expect to uh, get from uh, information theoretic garbled circuit. The benefits in the information theoretic gar garbled circuit is that the the data transfer is about three times smaller than the best state of the art, even with two garbled row reduction. Um, um, okay, so there is a lot of code optimization that we did, and much, you know, uh, a lot to, still to do. Uh, privacy improvement. So uh, we, so, so surprisingly, this. Uh, managing a lot of this data takes a long time. So, for example, the setup phase of our system takes a, a day or two, and same for MySQL. So, it's not uh, it's not surprising. So, building these indices, uh, etc. Um, but uh, so during the execution times, you run many executions, and then you accumulate these tree search patterns. And we thought, what can you do if you can reset it? And it turns out that we can, uh, for cheap, uh, we can reset or largely reset the accumulated information by rebuilding the, this index, the search index structures. And uh, it turns out that we can do it in about 20 minutes to, to, to rebuild the entire database. So ignore the slides. Um, um, so a, a big feature of, uh, um, of the database management is that the policy compliance, because the query is private, so the server does not see the query but it wants to ensure that only authorized queries um, uh, are allowed to execute or return data. So this is a big requirement from IARP and we meet it. Um, so we need to make sure that the policy, okay, so the security policy, secure policy checking says that the policy rejection should look like, uh, uh, like an M, the query that re returned the empty result set. And, um, it works for us because we're based on garbled circuit. And what you can do, sort of the natural way, is that you have a policy checking circuit that outputs some uh, encoded value, and then you, you have a, a search circuit, and then you just do a conjunction of those. And, and that's, uh, so that's all great. And then finally, well, so there is a malicious client protection that's a, a big feature um, because you would think, so you know, there's a lot of discussion that malicious. Uh, garbled circuit is much less efficient than uh, Semyonis garbled circuit. And we deal with it with uh, no overhead in efficiency, but a little bit of uh, privacy loss. So that's, um, that was our um, way of doing it. And sort of the uh, intuition of just, just to say what we did, just an intuition, is that so the garbled circuit, the good property uh, that we use for garbled circuit is that it is secure against malicious evaluator. So the way that Tal was describing it is that the client generates this garbled circuit, uh, just, you know, 
four more minutes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the, so the client generates a garble circuit uh, because he knows the query, right? And it's uh, uh, so what we did uh, is that we have now the index server generate the garble circuit, uh, right? So now the client, when he evaluates it, he cannot cheat. But now, the index server does not know the query. So what we do is that the index server will generate the universal circuit, and then the client's input will be plugged in, into there. So let's see how, I'm going to skip this part. So in phase one, the picture was that, so the client roughly, you know, the, uh, this is the garble circuit evaluation uh, that checks the policy, and then the query, and then there is a conjunction. So now this guy, um, will be able to um, to send different queries and win, but by um, by doing the right things, we can prevent that. So if this guy sends a universal circuit uh, here, right, then the client's input will define the function that is being computed. And now, by properly synchronizing the keys, the client input we, we can make sure that the same input is used in the policy. Uh, circuit and in this circuit. So now we have the guarantee that actually you cannot cheat. All right, and I'm going to skip. I mean, this is some uh, natural things of doing it. And uh, the universal circuit is actually cheap because we decided that we're not going to hide the structure of the circuit. So now there's almost no overhead. And then the second thing is that implementing of the universal gate actually costs you one gate because it can be done like so with the three XOR gates and the one non-XOR gate. And you can check later that the fact that is true. And um, sort of to finish the talk, I wanted to uh, uh, discuss you know, what is the practical circuit for MPC because I mean, we think that this is maybe a relatively useful thing in practice, uh, our system. So people always, I mean, starting a couple of years ago, I guess the PSSW was the, you know, they were thinking like, what, how do you benchmark those things? What is the right thing? And people think about what is, how do you, you know, what circuit you should evaluate? What practical circuit? You should say, well, my system does it in one second. And AES, DES, and all these things, I guess they're kind of practical circuits and they're reasonable. And the BITS auction gives an auction circuit that also you can say this is a reasonable practical uh, circuit. And so with this work and for this audience, we give you this sparse circuit, um, um, which is uh, our basic evaluation circuit at each step. And that is a, is a tree circuit. Um, it, uh, at, at the inputs, you do XOR between the player's inputs, then you do a conjunction uh, that evaluates to the Bloom filter value, and then you apply the formula. So this is a small circuit, but uh, you can also think about it as um, many times duplicated. Uh, so, so the way we, we do it is that the inputs uh, to the circuit, so you don't need to run OT on each circuit separately because the inputs on each circuit will be related. Um, so you can think of it as this is actually a, a very large circuit. So I don't have time to explain it, and this is where I'm finishing. Uh, well, I'll be happy to explain to you. Uh, I think this is a reasonable, practical circuit. Uh, I'm not sure how interesting it is for uh, benchmarking, but we'll see. So it's, it's a large uh, uh, and we think useful circuit. Okay, thank you. If I can start. So the second talk in uh, this Revo Talviste, he's going to talk about uh, database queries now for his approach about doing the practical linking of database queries using MPC. Reward. Yes, thank you for the introduction. And yes, I'm going to show you how multi-party computation can be used to do database linking and do it in a privacy-preserving manner. And actually, this is not all my work. Actually, there's a very large team behind it of like 18 people or something, so I didn't put all of their names even here. Um, so you can call it team share mind. Basically, let's go right to the problem statement. So uh, 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 let's assume that uh, a state is interested in uh, making really informed data-driven decisions, um, but it has a lot of databases and registries uh, scattered throughout 
uh, different agencies and uh, institutions. Um, and sometimes it's, it's not sufficient to actually analyze uh, like separate the distinct databases. Sometimes what you actually want to do is uh, to take several databases or registries, uh, combine those together and actually get more meaningful uh, results from the com combined database. And of course, uh, you should be uh, careful uh, when doing this because um, so, okay. Uh, because uh, instantly, if you start to copy your databases and put them together, then this kind of combined super databases, they really b become an attractive target <coughs> for uh, all kind of uh, all kinds of attackers. So it's uh, it's really a risky business. And uh, furthermore, sometimes you actually you are really forbidden to even combine databases when when they go contain sensitive data. Uh, of course, uh, you and I all, we know here that uh, you actually, in some of the cases at least, or in most of the cases, you actually do not need to combine uh, physically those uh, databases together. You should use secure multi-party computation and do your analysis on distributed data sets, of course. Um, so the, the talk is, uh, is uh, it, yes, it's about database linking, but I'm also giving a couple of uh, practical application scenarios because uh, just we, are, we have been doing a couple of them lately. So here's the first one. Uh, last <coughs> year, we created a practical MPC application to analyze the income data of uh, public sector in Estonia. So the data came from local governments and ministries. And basically what uh, made this application li a little bit simpler is the fact that uh, all of the ministries at local governments, their data, uh, basically, um, they had the same data structure. So all of them had triples of uh, job title, then the number of uh, people holding that position and then the, their salary. And basically what they did, they just uh, secret shared their uh, input records, those triples, and they input into this uh, one big table. And the actual uh, statistical analysis was done on this uh, one big uh, distributed secret shared database. Yeah. Um, since we had many input parties and it wasn't really feasible to deploy special purpose software for all of them, then we de decided to make a web-based MPC application um, for both the input and uh, like analysis part. And actually we furthermore decided to deploy it on a public cloud. And actually this is available as a public demo and I'd like to show it to you. Mm. Hope it gets bigger. Ah, maybe I can use that. Okay. So this is the first page. I'm not going to uh, like uh, explain it in detail. You can go and check it out yourself. Uh, the data input part is not public, but uh, the reporting part is. So I don't know how much you see, probably something. Uh, on the right side, you can see that uh, there, is, there are the statu like statuses of those uh, free computing parties. They are all under cyberneticus control at the moment because it's a demo. <laughs> but uh, you can actually see that uh, they are hosted by different uh, cloud providers. Amazon, Microsoft Azure, and then the third one is Estonian cloud provider. So when all of them are ready, we can uh, push the report button. And it says here that all of the secure multi-computation is done in real time. There is no caching or no recomputing. So this gives you an idea how long it actually it takes. So since uh, it says that I'm the only client at the moment, it should take around 30 seconds. Could you just yeah. like repeat 
what the inputs are and the outputs? Uh, the inputs are basically like uh, the number of uh, job title, number of people in that position and the count. And uh, the result is basically all kinds of averages grouped by like overall average salary for local governments, ministries and overall then average salary by local governments, all of them in Estonia, then average salary by ministries and average salary by position basically. So you can go and pl play around with it. Total combined? Uh, not really much. Uh, it's like uh, 1800, something like that. So, but yeah, it's, it's just computing like averages. So it's not like that kind of big, big deal, but it's deployed on a, like three separate public clouds. So the computation was done in real time over the internet. Okay, um, but like I said, what made this application a little bit simpler actually is that we actually didn't need any kind of like database linking technology here. There was like one big table basically. Um, now we are taking part in another project um, and this really has a, a more complicated scenario because uh, input parties really have different data structures. Um, so the project is called Privacy Preserving Statistical Studies on Linked Databases and um, it tries to give its input uh, uh, to a really ongoing argument between universities and companies and the problem is that uh, companies uh, tend to hire uh, students even during their uh, bachelor studies and universities really are not pleased with it because they, uh, they think that uh, then the students won't concentrate as much uh, on their studies and they, will, uh, like, they won't um, graduate on the right time or they will drop out and, and something like that. So it uh, has been a, like an ongoing argument and I guess, uh, well, uh, this is for Estonia, but I guess it's also, it holds for other countries. Um, so what, uh, what we are doing in this project is actually we are trying to answer the question if uh, this kind of early employment has some negative effect on further studies or further career. And in the first run, we are going to answer that question for ICT sector where the issue is most pressing. Um, and how are we going to do this? Well, it's pretty simple actually. We are going to take the income data from the tax office that's highly sensitive data, as you can guess. <laughs> and uh, then we are going to combine it with education data from the National Education Information System. And we can analyze the combined, combined data set and find out, for example, if uh, you were employed uh, starting from the second year of your bachelor studies, then what's the probability that uh, you dropped out or something like that? <laughs> or more meaningful results. And um, actually the, the project has two parts. So one of the partners is a statistical analysis company and they are solving this problem using a classical approach. So they are asking a data set, for relevant data set from the tax office and another data set from the education information system then they are using their everyday statistical analysis tools to combine those and do some statistical analysis on this combined data set. Of course, since we are dealing with sensitive data, this requires approval from data protection, protection agency that they already got. Um, but even then the tax office is actually forbidden to give out raw individual records of people's income <laughs> And they actually, um, they are going to apply K-anonymity on this, uh, on this input, their input data uh, to protect the privacy of uh, individuals. And actually just last week, this uh, analysis company got the data set from, uh, from the tax office and to their great surprise, um, after applying K-anonymity, when grouping with by education info, gender and age, 
the data loss was 76 to 98%, which means that uh, basically more than three quarters of the input data is, is just lost, which is pretty sad. Um, at the same time, what was the key, um, was the key value? Uh, I think it was like three, but it's just that the, the, the variance is so big. Uh, for example, uh, in the resulting data set, we had like only this 98% data loss is for PhD students in ICT sector. So uh, the, uh, the resulting set had only like eight PhD students and they have to do statistics on that. So at the same time, we are actually uh, doing the same thing with secure multi-party computation. So basically it uh, uh, looks the same way, uh, but uh, we are going to get uh, like signature the input data from the tax office and, uh, and another data set from the education information system. And we are actually going to use privacy preserving database linking uh, to combine those data sets. So um, basically both of those data sets have personal ID ID codes, uh, you can think of them as uh, social security numbers, and we use them to actually uh, combine the records in privacy preserving manner. And of course, the output will be also like a bigger database, but also secret shared. And when we approach data protection agency with, uh, uh, so we, we um, try to explain them what secure multi-party computation is and how this privacy preserving database linking works, then uh, they said that we actually do not require any special approval because we are not analyzing personal information because we can't see that information. So uh, this gives us hope that we actually are going to get um, better input from the tax office so that they do not have to use K anonymity so we can uh, get all of the relevant records uh, directly in secret shared form, of course. So we could get actually better, uh, like more accurate results from this. So we can like, uh, we can compare the classical approach and the MPC approach. Uh, the MPC platform we are going to use or we are using is share my application server. And just to know, just so you would know what it is, I'm going to show you briefly what, uh, what it can do, basically. So SharePoint Application Server is a practical implementation of uh, secure multi-party computation. And what uh, makes it a little bit different is the fact that it uses modular design with protection domains uh, that allows you to use uh, different uh, secure computation <coughs> schemes and different secret sharing schemes so, for example, additively secret shared two party with active security would be one protection domain, and then using n parties with some new secret sharing would be another one. And for historic reasons, uh, additively secret shared three party is our most evolved um, protection domain. So it has supports all kinds of uh, signed and unsigned integers, booleans. Then uh, I think we are one of the few who actually have 32 and 64 bit floating point numbers and uh, known and bounded length strings. And of course, there are like uh, many standard uh, arithmetic operations supported on all of them. So besides that, there is uh, oblivious sorting. So we have implemented sorting networks that are oblivious by nature, by the way. Um, so oblivious radic sorting, and then the oblivious quick sort proposed by Hamada and his team. Um, so then there is oblivious shuffle that actually this uh, quick sort uh, and radic sort use. So this lets you basically sh randomly shuffle the rows or columns in your data matrix. matrix. And then there is this. Um, main thing for this project, privacy preserving database linking. And you can really think of this as a privacy preserving uh, equivalent of SQL join. So you just have two tables, you pick key columns, and based on 
the equality of values in those key columns, you just combine the records together. Yeah. So, and what actually makes this share mine implementation an application server, like you would have uh, Java application servers, Classfish and JBoss and so on. So it has data persistence layer. Uh, so basically you can uh, use uh, database to store data in secret shared form or in all public data. And it's fully programmable. So you would actually just write programs and then uh, deploy them on, on your system. Yeah. And the programs are written in a special programming language called secrecy that uses a hybrid model. So here's a simple example. Um, uh, you first import the protection domain kind module called additive free PP, that stands for additively secret shared free party passive. Then you create a new domain private using this uh, protection domain kind. So whenever you declare a value to be private, it actually means that it's uh, additively secret shared between three parties. And the simple example here shows you that, uh, well, we first initial initialized two integers, uh, they are actually secret shared. It doesn't make much sense here because you, we are using constant values and you know the values, but in real applications you would actually load the shares from the database. Um, so we are like multiplying them together. The result is also private. And now if we want to, for example, print the value out, then, uh, mm -hmm. Then we can't do it directly because C is just a share. We have to move it uh, from this private domain to public domain. Public domain is something that you always have. So, and for that we have to explicitly use the declassify operation. Um, so I had like five minutes. Okay. Um, then I'll skip this slide that uh, shows protection to mankind polymorphism. I can talk to you you later about it. So based on this um, secrecy and all of the like data types and uh, stuff, we have standard library and the big part of it is actually a statistic suit uh, that has stable filtering, linking and sorting and all kinds of uh, descriptive statistics like mean, variance and standard deviation. And actually they are using floating point numbers. <laughs> so you get secret shared floating point numbers out of the system that you can use in further computation. And then five number summary, box plots, histograms, uh, T tests, C square test, Wilcoxon test, and so on. Um, all of those algorithm, algorithms support oblivious filters, which means that um, when you have a table of like 100 rows, then if you want to apply a filter of like uh, age uh, greater than 18, then you won't get uh, back like a smaller table, but you would actually get back a 100 element secret shared Boolean vector indicating which uh, rows matched your predicate. Um, yeah, so our goal is to build an R-like statistics application. And you may be wondering why we chose statistics. Well, at the beginning of a another project called Usable and Efficient Secure Multiparty Computation, we performed 25 interviews and we explained to different domain experts what MPC is and asked if they had some like uh, problems that maybe could be solved by using MPC. And one of the most popular answers were statistics. And I guess I have like two minutes, I hope. Uh, so I'm going to give you a sneak preview of what's uh, I don't have this R-like application yet, so, but uh, we have another web-based thing because uh, we are getting really good at this. Um, so this is not public. Um, let me see just uh, mean of, uh, wait, maybe it does something. Let's see. It takes some time. This is a local computation. At the moment, it runs in a virtual machine on this computer, but uh, it. Uh, it's a David's feature. What? It's a David's feature. 
This is David's feature, right? He made it slower, so we're getting pressed. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's artificially made slower. So. What's the size of um, I guess at the moment it has only a couple of hundred rows, but there's some uh, floating point computation that's really, really, really slow. Um, I have to see if something. Oh, it crashed. Cool. Um, let me try again. Um, yeah, it, this is the last thing, so. <laughs> Just to be on the safe side. Um, they should connect. And the third one. Me? Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Uh, it's, uh, it's only a prototype and it's uh, actually held together by a lot of magic at the moment. Yeah. So when you got the, the, the data protection agency to approve this, yep. did they ask you anything about the queries that you would allow? Yes, 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 yes. yes. We only, like the thing is that uh, you deploy this shareMind application server and then you deploy your programs, and there you define what kind of uh, queries you actually accept. So all of the free computation parties must basically accept the query to start, uh, start the computation. So this is predefined, yes, of course, because in real time it's really like, difficult to like, uh, make it so that you can't do anything stupid. In a sense, yes. Here it is. Um, <laughs> um, yep. Yeah. So, can start. So there was one question which I also wanted to ask. If probably you made comparison with K anonymity, but uh, I find that say K anonymity or differential privacy and MPC to be. Uh, like I mean, with MPC, you're still outputting the result. Right? Yeah, they are completely different. Like K anonymity and differential privacy, they are like privacy. They are output privacy. MPC doesn't like doesn't give you any output output privacy. Yeah. So, That's for example, in your first, uh, you're still storing the whole histogram. So, say if I have half database, you have other half, and I can determine many things about the you other half when we are linking to databases. So. Although you are doing yes. MPC, but the final result is going to public, so indeed, uh, I don't know, I feel like there is some privacy law that Yeah, sure, sure. There, there could be. So, um, actually, what uh, happened in this project is actually the statistical analysis company, they told what they would like to do and what they are going to do, and this is like... Um, this kind of capability is a little bit hard coded into the system. So, and this is accepted by this uh, tax office and uh, education information system. So they know what kind of queries are made. But uh, since we, we get like raw data, we should get more accurate results. But this is an ongoing project because we we do like statistics on raw data. Whether they the statistical analysis company had to like uh, do statistics with pre-aggregated data. <laughs>